Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. When you're going through a hard time, you can say, God, I don't like this. It doesn't feel good. But I'm going to rejoice anyway because I know that I'm going to gain something out of this. I'm going to get something out of this. I'm going to be more mature. I'm going to know you better when this is over than I did when it started. And I'm encouraging you to say those things out loud. It'll be good for you to say, this doesn't feel good. It hurts, God. And I would really, in my natural person, prefer not to be here. But I know that you've got a plan. And I know that you're going to work something good in me. And when the time is just right, you will change my circumstance. <laughs> Could I get you to start doing that? Saying some things out loud. And when you do, when you talk out loud the way God wants you to, according to the Word of God, it will change your feelings and it will change your mind. Or you can just sit there and go with the way you feel. And what you think. Go to 1 Peter chapter 3. But even in case you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. <laughs> Happy. And to be envied. Don't dread or be afraid of their threats, nor be disturbed by their opposition. Even if you do the right thing <clears throat> and you suffer for it. Now, you know, my head just goes tilt, 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 tilt. Something's wrong with this. Something's wrong with this. If I do the right thing, I should get the right result. If I do the right thing, I should be blessed. Well, he's saying you are blessed, but you're blessed on a deeper level. I think the best thing that can happen to us in our lives, I said this today one morning last week. I said, the greatest thing that God can teach us is how to be happy when things don't go the way we want them to. In Matthew chapter 5, we have a famous sermon from Jesus called the Sermon on the Mount or the Beatitudes spelled B-E-A-U-T-I-T-U-D-E-S, but I like to call them the B-attitudes, B-E slash attitudes. They're the attitudes that we need to have if we want to have the joy that God says we can have. So if we could look at Matthew chapter 5 for just a moment. Blessed. And the Amplified Bible tells us what it means when we say, Blessed. If I say, God bless you, this is what it means. Happy to be envied and spiritually prosperous with life joy and satisfaction. I love satisfaction in God's favor and salvation regardless of your outward conditions. Oh, how awesome is that? Let's look at it again. Blessed. If I say, God bless you, then what I'm saying, I want you to be happy, so happy that you're envied, and I want you to be spiritually prosperous. You notice it's not talking about my bank account. With life, joy, and satisfaction in God's favor and salvation, regardless of what's going on in your life. And can I tell you a secret? I think we spend a lot of time praying prayers that God's not all that interested in hearing. I think we talk to him way too much about stuff and things that we need and people that need to change for us to be happy and pay raises and bigger houses and new cars and getting married or getting out of being married or whatever it might be. And I want to challenge you to start praying a little bit differently. Get up every day and say, you know, God, like anybody else, I hope everything goes my way today. But in case it doesn't, I'm praying right now that I'll remain stable. And that I will just be as happy as I would be if everything was going my way. Did it ever occur to you to pray ahead of time that you could be stable when you're not getting your way? I prayed that yesterday and today. And I pray that very often. We all want what we want. And there's nothing 
really wrong with that. We're human beings, and many times God does give you what you want. But we all know from experience that we don't always have every day go just the way that we'd like it to go. We have so many unbelievable hotel experiences in our ministry travel. And one would think, with the number of years that I have done this, and the number of hotels that I have stayed in, that I could get just a little tiny extra favor from God. <laughs> and I could get in hotels where everything works. But no, once again, here in Albany. <laughs> when in our hotel on Thursday, usually when I get in town on Thursday, I like to study and take a little nap, get ready for Thursday night. The people who cleaned the room had left all the blinds open and the sun was pouring into the room and it's unseasonably hot here, so no amount of air conditioning was gonna pull the temperature down, therefore I couldn't sleep. Turned the water faucet on in the sink, in the kitchen, and the faucet came off in my hand. <laughs> my bathroom sink was stopped up. If you ran water in it, then you had to turn the water off, and you had to wait for it to dribble out until you could run any more water. Thursday night, 12.30 at night, somebody tried to get in our room. It was a man who'd been sent to collect hangers out of empty rooms. And we had that lock locked on our door, and so when he shoved on it, it made this loud noise, and Dave jumps up and goes over there, what do you think they're doing? What are you, what are you trying to get into this room for? Who are you? What do you want? And the guy said, ooh, ooh, ooh. I thought the room was empty. Well, of course, by then, you know, we're all awake, and we're like, we always ask the desk not to put calls through to my room, and I'm sure you can understand that because there's no telling who all might want to call me and how often they might want to call, not realizing that I need to rest and study. And yet, I was taking my nap on Friday, sleeping nicely, and the phone starts ringing. Then yesterday, when we went home from the meeting, you would have loved to have seen this. We should have really taken a picture. This happens to us. I cannot tell you how many times this happens to us. They change the key card and you cannot get in your room. <laughs> Even though you're still paying for the room, you cannot get in it. So they went and got a guy that was supposedly had a master key and even his key wouldn't work. So here we are, me, Dave, my administrative assistant, we're just hanging out in the hotel hall, sitting in the floor. After being here, doing this great meeting and everybody clapping and cheering, I think it's just God's way of letting me know that just remember who you are and where you came from. Just, just have a little seat right there in the dirty floor and be patient and act like you tell everybody else to act in these meetings. Come on. But you know, the Bible actually says when things like that are going on, if I can remain the same, then I am so blessed. Actually, what happens When, when you can do that, your attitude is preaching a message to the devil. You are a loser. Once again, you didn't get me. Blessed are the poor in spirit, those who have a humble attitude. Blessed are those who, when they mourn, keep a positive attitude because they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, those who have a very contented attitude. You know, a person who's not meek is haughty and proud, and they always think they deserve more than what they have. But a meek person is extremely thankful for every little thing that God or anybody else does for them. 
Blessed are those that are hungry for righteousness sake. They have an attitude of excellence. They always want to do what's right. Blessed are the merciful. They have a very forgiving attitude. Oh, don't worry about it. I make plenty of mistakes myself. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who work for unity in themselves and with other people. And blessed are those who are persecuted for doing what's right, who keep an attitude of excellence no matter what it costs. Some people are set on excellence until it hurts. And then as soon as it hurts, they no longer want to be excellent. You know, we see a group of people in the Old Testament, we call them the Israelites because they were from Israel. And they became slaves in Egypt and spent many years in bondage and they cried out to God desperately and God sent them a deliverer, Moses, after he had him spend 40 years on the backside of the desert getting some equipment and some experience. Come on, how many of you were here last night? All right. And he led them out of bondage. God did great miracles, parted the Red Sea. Their breakfast rained down from the sky every morning. So many amazing miracles, water coming out of the rock, all kinds of stuff. And yet the Bible says that they wandered, wandered. in the desert 40 years trying to make what was actually an 11-day journey. And I would imagine some of you are related to those people. I certainly know that they used to be my close relatives. And they thought their problem was the enemies. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Parasites, you know, all the sites. <laughs> the ites. And I always say we've all got our own brand of ites. The grouchy bossites, the bad neighborites, the backacheites. <laughs> no matter what you call them, we've all got them. And we blame the devil and we blame our circumstances and we blame other people. But like I said in yesterday morning's service, I believe it's time to take responsibility for your own joy. Stop giving someone else the responsibility to keep you happy. If you want to be happy, be happy. And if you want to be miserable, nobody's going to be able to stop you. I had such a bad attitude in the early years of our marriage because I'd been abused so badly as a child and just was very negative and not trusting and all these things. And, you know, Dave tried for a while, like any good husband would, to try to keep me happy and he would try to do this and he'd try to do that. And, Two or three years went by and he looked at me one day and he said, you know what, I've decided no matter what I do, you're not going to be happy, so I'm done trying. When you decide to get happy, let me know. And can I tell you a secret? Some of you are in relationship with people that you need to say the same thing to. Because you've been jumping hoops around them long enough trying to keep them happy and they've already decided they're not going to be happy. And so really you become codependent on their problem and their joy determines your joy and you need to make a decision. I'm going to be happy. You do whatever you want to. Amen. And it's going to make them mad at first, but it may change them. That was one of the best things that Dave did for me was not let me control his joy. Why have you been 40 years trying to make an 11-day journey? It wasn't their enemies, it was their attitude. They blamed Moses, they blamed God, they easily got discouraged, they were easily depressed, very impatient, always thought they should have more than what they had, very ungrateful, very unthankful. You know, if we do the right thing, then eventually we'll get the right result. But amazes me the people who don't want to do the right thing, and then they have a bad attitude toward people who are blessed because they did the right thing. You know, I finally got tired of people being jealous of me because of this, this, and that, and that, and something else. And I finally just started thinking, you know what? 
Don't want what somebody else has unless you're willing to do what they did to get it. <laughs> Genesis chapter 4, Cain and Abel. But for Cain, well, let, let's, let's start in verse 3. And in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel brought of the firstborn of his flock and of the fat portions. And the Lord had respect and regard for Abel and for his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no respect or regard. Cain offered the work of his own hands. He offered his own works, which God is never pleased with. But Abel offered the firstborn of his flock. I don't know all the reasons why God disrespected Cain's offering, but I'm sure there was a lot of attitude going on there. But for Cain and his offering, verse 5, he had no respect or regard. So Cain was exceedingly angry and indignant, and he looked sad and depressed. He immediately got a bad attitude. It didn't occur to him to think, okay, now if God's not pleased with my offering, then what am I doing wrong that I need to change? Hello. If things aren't working out in my life, then what, what do I need to look at? We always want to, it's your fault, it's your fault, it's your fault, it's your fault, it's your fault. If you continue in my word, you'll know the truth, Jesus said, and the truth will make you free. But it's not the truth about your husband or your kids or your parents or your neighbors that'll make you free. It's the truth that God reveals to you about you. And I know other people have problems. I deal with people all the time with problems. And I'm certainly not saying they don't need to change, but I can't do anything about them. The only person that I can hope to see any change in is me if I let God work in me and other people only if I pray for them and trust God to work. <clears throat> Okay, verse 6, and maybe God would want to speak this to some of you today or some watching by TV. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why do you look sad and depressed and dejected? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, then sin crouches at your door and its desire is for you. And I love this part, but you must master it. You must master it. Don't blame everybody else. Don't blame God. Don't blame the devil. If you do well, you'll be blessed. If you don't, then sin is crouching at your door, and you must resist it and stand against it. One of the best ways, one of the easiest and the best ways to keep yourself right in the center of God's will is to just keep a good attitude. What are some of the most important attitudes? I think that one of the most important things is to always maintain a merciful attitude. Always remember that you've made lots of mistakes and when other people make mistakes, you don't need to be hard and harsh and legalistic and rigid with them. One of the best things that you can say to people, unless it's a situation where you really do need to deal with something, the best thing to say is don't worry about it, I make plenty of mistakes on my own. And you know, I've learned to go out of my way when people make mistakes. I always try to make sure that I go back to them, that I go the extra mile. And even if they've said they're sorry, I, I want to make sure that my response to them is aggressive enough that they really know that I'm not still bothered. Because sometimes somebody can do something to hurt us and they say, I'm sorry, and we're like, yeah, okay. And then they go around and they feel guilty and they're worried about it. It's always nice to just pick the phone up and say, hey, I just want you to know, I don't want you to be concerned about this. Especially with me being in the position of authority I'm in, I know that if people make a boo-boo in front of me and maybe do something that they shouldn't do, that they can feel extra bad. And so I go that extra mile to call them and just say, hey, it's okay. I've made plenty of mistakes in my life. Don't worry about it. Have a merciful attitude. And believe me, 
I didn't show up on planet Earth with one. I had to develop one. You can develop right attitudes. There are personalities, our temperaments, really. Our personality is a result of the God-given temperament we have and then the things that happened to us in the first few years of our life, and then we call that a personality. Your base bottom line temperament can't be changed, but your personality can always be changed and improved. I'm always going to be an aggressive person, but I've learned to not run all over other people in the midst of my aggression. So there are different personality types, and to be very honest, some people are going to lean a little bit more toward being negative than some other temperament types. I mean, you have the happy, zappy, sanguine people they park their car and then come out and don't know where it's at in the parking lot and they just think it's a big joke, it's all funny and you know, you're going to be late for your appointment and they're just making a party out of the fact that they can't find their car and you're like, will you get some responsibility and act like you've got a brain? So I'm going to tell you, there are some people that are just naturally more happy and up and it's easy for them to have that no, nose high attitude all the time and I think Dave is a little bit like that he's a more laid-back person not much bothers him and I think it's easier for him to just be happy I'm deeper and have a more I feel responsible for the whole world which is my fault and you know I've got I've always had a false sense of responsibility which I've improved greatly in the last 10 or 15 years but the thing is, is I had to work a little more on having a good attitude than maybe he did. But you can't even feel sorry for yourself because of that. Don't say, well, that's just the way I am. That's just the way I am. Don't use that as an excuse. Say, I don't care what kind of problem I've got. With God's help, I can get to the point where I can keep and maintain a good attitude at all times. Maintaining a right attitude is easier than regaining a right attitude. See, it takes a lot of energy to get up and be down, then try to uh, get back up again, then something else happens you don't like, well, then, then you got to call everybody to pray for you, get your truckload full of Christians to pick you up again. And, uh, you're back up. Now something else happens you don't like. <laughs> I lived like that for years and I finally thought, you know what, this is just wearing me out. <laughs> the up and the down, the up and the down, the up and the down. And I actually found out it's easier for me to not let myself get upset than it is to get upset and then try to calm down. <laughs> Amen? Resist the devil at his onset. Your attitude is the prophet of your future. It's your best friend or your worst enemy. It's the thing that draws people to us or repels them from us. And it is the primary force that will determine whether we succeed or fail. And to be honest, it really has a lot to do with whether or not we're pleasing to God. Well, let's always remember that it's our attitude toward our problems that's our real problem. As followers of Jesus Christ, we can rejoice that we have the problem solver living on the inside of us. This community likes boys, so they want their boys to go to school first. The girls, they don't have any, any value when it comes to education for them. So if they can get some money for her and not have the burden of having to care for her, 
it helps the family. The flags that you see on the homes over my shoulder represent a long-standing tradition that is very difficult on girls. As soon as a very young girl reaches puberty and she's of childbearing years, you'll see these flags above their houses representing the fact that a young girl is available to a man, essentially on the market, up for sale. And at that point, her life changes dramatically. So what they do is they take them out of school and they'll actually go through different activities, teaching them how to cook, how to be a, a wife in the, in the home. But part of it is also how to please a man. And that's through, you know, normal things in the house, but also sexually. So they teach them different things about sexuality and so on. So we are doing anything that we can to help people understand the value of girls. That's the key. And helping these girls by taking them into a program <laughs> called Imagine Hope. If they would live with us for six months and we would have devotions, lead them to the Lord, really mentor them in how to be a godly woman, and then at the same time teach them how to do some skills, basic things like jewelry making or whatever it is, that they can have some kind of an income that they can bring to their families. This is a good hat. Were you afraid when you thought that you were going to have to be married? Some of my friends, they are already married now, but they are used to suffer in that marriage. So if myself, I was afraid to be married while I'm still young, but because of this program, my mom, she didn't take me to the marriage, but she bring me here so that I can proceed with my education, so that I can help her in future change our situation. I, I'm so grateful. I wish I could bring everyone here and let them see the impact of what's happening. Um, and I'm grateful for it because we should give and we should give to those that we don't benefit us. And I think that's what Hand of Hope does and, and we're grateful for that. We are helping young women like this all over the world. Help us to guide, restore, and love young girls. Your designated gift today, if you choose, can go to Project Girl, or you can give toward water, you can give toward feeding, and do something that you know will make a difference.